This is Climate One. Our brains have evolved over millions of years to deal with immediate and direct challenges, but they're not so great at processing relatively new and indirect threats posed by carbon dioxide. It isn't the least bit surprising that our brains simply are not matched for this very, very rapid onset problem in evolutionary time. And our brains, which like immediate gratification, are challenged by environmental and other actions that involve cost today and benefits in the future. Pro-environmental decisions that we make generally are simply not going to feel as rewarding in the same way that we're used to making decisions. Maybe we need to change the way we frame our actions altogether. This is why we need to bring happiness into this picture, because your happiness benefit is instantaneous. Happiness and climate action can go together. Up next on Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. And I'm Ariana Brocious. It's often said that the climate crisis is the biggest threat that we faced as a species. And yet we have real difficulties grasping what that actually means. Right. Our brains are the result of millions of years of evolution that taught us to react to immediate challenges that largely remained unchanged for eons predators, human rivals, and food shortages. And on an evolutionary scale, climate is a relatively new crisis, but it's moving fast on the scale of our lifetimes. Just look at those retreating glaciers. And we are responding to it slowly. Too slowly. The latest IPCC summary assessment report makes it clear that if we don't bring emissions down immediately, we will very likely shoot past the Paris Agreement goal of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And we'll do that by the early 2030s. We have all the knowledge, technology, and money we need to achieve that goal. But industry-funded campaigns have spent gobs of money sowing doubt about the problem and delaying actions. And governments and corporations all around the world are still moving too slowly. Still, polls show that as many as two-thirds of Americans want to see stronger government action on climate. They are aware and they care. But according to a study published in Nature last year, most Americans underestimate the actual true level of broad public support. And we have seen some great progress on the climate policy and markets front, especially in the U.S. in this last year. But we're still not acting at the necessary speed and scale. And frankly, I found this latest report kind of scary and disheartening because it just seems so unlikely that we can manage to dramatically cut emissions today. I often feel the same way, but the report authors also clearly wanted to signal that there is hope. We have the power. We just need to act. Which raises the question, how do our brains process an existential crisis unfolding all around us right now? To find out, I had a conversation with Anne-Christine Duhame, a pediatric neurosurgeon and author of Minding the Climate, How Neuroscience Can Help Solve Our Environmental Crisis. I asked her why our brains are so ill-equipped to take action on climate disruption caused by burning fossil fuels. Our brains were designed over millennia, over millions, even billions of years, if you go all the way back to the essential components on which our brains uh, were designed. And that period of time is really long. And the period of time of climate change is really short. Uh, And that's why we haven't caught up to these very rapid changes in science, technology, culture, and their effects on our climate. So it isn't the least bit surprising that our brains simply are not matched for this very, very rapid onset problem in evolutionary time, not necessarily in our perceptual time, but in evolutionary time, which is the time that our brains were designed. One thing you write about in your book is is that humans are guided by this internal mechanism that evaluates our actions in relation to rewards. And a big reward, especially of this modern era, is consumption. And you say it is more fun to get more or do more than to simplify. So help us understand how that innate reward system, especially for those of us that live in wealthy industrialized nations, is driving the climate crisis. Sure. First, let's talk about the word reward. And in normal conversation, when we say reward, we think about something you get from using your credit card that's an extra bonus or something that you get, you know, extra points that are your reward. Or we think of reward as something you get for doing something good and you get a prize. And when we're talking about reward in the context of the human nervous system and the reward system, the word is used 
in a little bit different context. And it's important to understand the difference. The human or any creature, because because many, many creatures uh, going back to very ancient times have a so-called reward system, is a system of how your nervous system is designed to work uh, such that events or behaviors that are beneficial for short-term survival are made more likely to be repeated. And the system that does that is called the reward system. Now, my work has been criticized by people who say, gee, it's not all about rewards because not everything is a good thing. Not all things that influence behavior are good things. And it's important to understand that your brain uses this mechanism of reward as one part of a weight in a very complicated system that evaluates your decisions minute to minute, second to second, based on millions of different inputs at any given time. And when the weight of the decision favors something typically that is historically associated with short-term survival and reproduction, that weight is enhanced by the pressures of evolution. So the reward system does, on average, never uh, with complete predictability, but on average for people, it does lean us towards things like getting more, consuming more, having more, having more security, having more food, having more choices, having more interesting experiences, because all of these things were part of our evolutionary influences that helped to form the systems that we work with now. That isn't to say that one person isn't different from another person or that a single person doesn't change over time in what is rewarding. But there are certain predispositions based on the history we all share in common, overlaid with our own genetics, our own experiences, and our own current circumstances. And I think this is so interesting because, you know, you discussing this idea of reward and the way it can be almost a negative feedback loop is thinking of maybe overconsumption, right? As you're talking about. So over over consuming a resource like food even can be unhealthy for our bodies or over consuming a drug, an addiction, that type of a thing. And so if we're over consuming uh, lots of things, then we're what, adding more carbon to the atmosphere and, and thus increasing the pace of the climate crisis? Right. But remember that you can perceive immediately what it is that you as an individual, let's say, consume, uh, you know, that thing that comes and gets delivered to your door or that new thing you go buy or the new house or whatever it is that's new and in, in the consumption category. But the effects that are negative from any given single thing, A, you know, intellectually are quite small and B, you don't see them. We don't have sensors that we evolved to need for survival for carbon dioxide. We can't even perceive it. The only way you know about carbon dioxide is to hear about it, usually from strangers, usually people you don't know and don't necessarily trust, usually using information that you don't know directly from your own experience. You can't know it because it's not part of our equipment to be able to even perceive it. So on one hand, you have something that's immediate, tangible, feels good, uh, is designed by evolution to make you feel more secure or, or more accomplished or lots of things that are in the more category. Uh, and you have to balance that against something that is fairly remote, fairly difficult to conceptualize, fairly unfamiliar. Of course, this varies from person to person. And just doesn't have the same weight in your nervous system. Hmm. So I want to connect this to how we can shift maybe some of these reward systems to actually be more climate beneficial. So an example of maybe that shifting context that can affect how we feel about these rewards, these, these you know, mental processes gauging our our actions. I had a gas stove for a very long time. I used to really like it. I thought every time I turned it on and had the click and the light of the gas, it was sort of this little like, ah, I'm cooking, I'm doing, you know, it was enjoyable. I liked it. I liked to cook. Um, as I learned about the health hazards of combusting methane inside my kitchen, I began to not like that and it got to the point where actually turning on the gas stove or oven um, bothered me because I would smell the the gas and it 
just reminded me about, you know, why this isn't a good thing to be breathing. And so for me, that did shift, you know, this thing I had been associating with the positive thing was now to me sort of a negative. So how can we hack, in a sense, our internal reward system to be more aligned with environmentally friendly behaviors. Ariana, that is such a perfect example, the gas stove example. It's wonderful because what did you have to do? And and the way you just described it is exactly the way the process happens. Here was something positive, probably even the smell of the gas, because only the coolest cooks cook with a gas stove. Like you're really in the, in the know if you have a gas stove. And for a long time, everyone was... Um, you know, uh, um, taught that or or heard that through the grapevine of the way we learn things, which is through our peers, our society, other people. And now, of course, things we read, things we see, things we hear online, all kinds of sources of information. And true, serious, really cool cooks all cooked with a gas stove. And so when you even smelled the gas and saw the blue flame and, and got the special pot that went on the gas stove, this all was rewarding. It was reinforcing. It made you feel good in, in, in many, many ways. And then when you served that great food or ate it yourself, you felt even better. It's all part of, of how we make decisions, how we develop preferences. Um, now, it's so interesting to me and, and so in alignment with everything that is described in the book, how you changed. So what was the input? The input was, you know, you're an intelligent person who is well-read and knowledgeable. And this whole climate change thing is starting to, I'm projecting onto you based on the little that you gave me, but, but it's starting to bother you. It's, you know, you're starting to feel like I need to do something. And now that thing that was positive becomes aversive. The very smell of the gas became aversive. It's like, this is methane natural gas, baloney. This is methane. This is a bad greenhouse gas. And in addition, you have read and heard and learned that it's full of all kinds of particulates. It increases the rate of asthma. It gives you worse indoor air quality. There's all sorts of health effects. Now something that was positive has become negative. And this is how change occurs. Your brain, our brains are exquisitely designed to be influenced by all kinds of inputs so that we can change our preferences. Now, the problem that we run into with climate change is that those inputs, by and large, are not the ones that we are designed to find most powerful. And that's because, as I set up earlier, uh, it is information that is distant from people we don't know, from experts with expertise we can't share, telling us things that make us feel bad and not good. And so even though you changed your opinion about your stove, until you get a brand new, fancier stove that is not gas that you love, that the be, yeah, induction. That although there are people who are, you know, there's there's all sorts of forces at at work in the world to try to shift your preferences and mine. Uh, but let's say it's an inductive stove, and now you learn to cook on that, and you have to get over the hurdle of transitioning your behavior to something new. You have to learn to cook a new way. You might have to get, you know, different pots and pans, whatever. You change your recipes. It's work. So you've just given the perfect three-part difficulty of climate change behavior with respect to the human reward system, which is you're pretty comfortable with the way things are. You like them. You have to make a change based on intellectual input, not a visceral input, not something that is negative necessarily in and of itself, but something you hear cognitively not in your gut. Yes, your gut may say, I don't really want to have bad indoor air quality. I'm worried about my family or whatever, but still it's invisible. It's, it's totally invisible. Now you have to make a change that requires intellectual homework. It requires uh, potentially investment of resources. It involves learning new things and changing your behavior for what? And this is what is so difficult. However, you've also described perfectly how it can be done. The difficulty is that a lot of it is input from intellectual sources, from cognitive input, not from burning your finger on the stove, therefore you need something new, or you know it doesn't cook well anymore. I mean, those aren't the causes. The causes are basically things you learn. And things that we learn from strangers that we don't know, that are not parts of our own social network, it's just a, a bigger lift. It can be done, however. Taking that just one step further, I mean, you've explained these uh, sort of the 
neuroscience here, but, you know, psychology has a lot as well to play. And I'm curious if you can explain how there's a complement between psychological behavioral change aspects of this and the idea of nudges. Can nudges be enough to shift behavior in the ways we're talking about? Right. Great questions. So first off, why does neuroscience matter at all in this? Like we all have brains. What difference does it make? The question I set out to try to answer for myself in this exploration was, are our brains malleable enough? Can we change? Do we have the capacity to change? Because remember that our brains are biologic organisms, just like our hearts and our livers and all those other sort of, to me, kind of less interesting parts of us. But uh, it nonetheless has certain limits. And one of the questions is, does our brain have enough flexibility to make these kinds of changes? Because if we don't, then that's a different story. And if we do, then we need to look at what is it that helps us to change? So part two of your question is, what about psychology? Psychology is super helpful as a discipline to um, studying and teaching what is it that helps us change in a given context, in a given set of circumstances. So the neuroscience is how much can we change? What are our biologic limits? And the psychology part is, what has worked to make people change in the past? So you mentioned nudges, and for listeners who you know aren't super familiar with what that's all about, it's a matter of what's called choice architecture. The classic example is in a school cafeteria, you don't want the kids to eat the you know puff pastry that has 400 calories in one bite. You want them to eat fresh fruits at the end of the dessert line. And so what do you do? You don't take away the puff pastry, um, but you put the apples where it's easier to reach and you shine them up so they look really pretty. And it's the last thing they see before they you know, check through. It just makes the healthier, you know, cheaper, whatever your, whatever your um, goal is, it makes that choice the simpler choice. Uh, and that has been applied to changing behavior for climate related goals. Uh, and it's had mixed success. There are some people who have done some experiments that suggest, okay, maybe in certain ways it helps. It may not be enough. In fact, there is no one single behavior change strategy that's going to be enough. But the ones that seem to be the most powerful in difficult behavior change overall one of the biggest is substituting the rewards you're giving up, get, getting rid of the rewards you're giving up, and substituting social rewards. And social rewards are incredibly powerful. So you with your stove might have had a better time if you and your sister and three of your closest friends all had gas stoves, all took cooking class together, all you know went to each other's house and did brunch, and you all decided to get rid of your, your gas stoves at the same time. Here's a social reward where each of you is reinforcing the other, and those um, ripple effects can be very, very powerful. You're listening to a Climate One conversation about how human brains understand and evaluate behavioral change. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review. You can do it right now on your device. You can also help by sending a link to this episode to a friend. By sharing, you can help your friends have their own deeper, meaningful climate conversations. Coming up, how does the framing of individual climate action affect people's motivations? Those narratives make people feel shameful and guilty. And these negative emotions are not conducive to long-term behavior change. That's up next. Understanding why people behave the way they do could be a critical step in bringing about more meaningful and quicker climate action. But we as individuals can only achieve so much. How do we influence those in power to alter systems? Let's get back to Ariana's conversation with pediatric neurosurgeon and Christine Duhame. Social movements uh, work. If they didn't work, people wouldn't do them. They don't always work. But uh, you look at the sunshine movement, you look at some of the, the youth movements, you look at some of the, you know, politically very disruptive movements in climate. And these kinds of things, while people pay an enormous price sometimes for participating in these, loss of, loss of jobs, loss of friends, sometimes even loss of life and limb, these are, these are scary things. Nonetheless, 
do move the needle, just like lots of other things move the needle. Economic incentives that align because of political action move the needle. You know, you only need to look at some recent uh, legislation. I'm here in the city of Boston and the state of Massachusetts, where this kind of legislation has made the needle of the business I work at, which is a large academic medical center, it's moved that needle so that because of regulations, we have to be greener in the things we do. We are obligated to do that. So there are changes at multiple levels, political, legislative movements that spur these kinds of changes on. And then, of course, there's individual people who change for all kinds of reasons. A legislator has a grandchild. A CEO uh, sees a movie. I mean, uh, you know, somebody reads a book. There's all kinds of things. And each of these can be interpreted through how they act in your brain to change the complicated equations by which you make decisions. But the difficult thing is that we have to realize that pro-environmental decisions that we make generally are simply not going to feel as rewarding in the same way that we're used to making decisions. They may feel intellectually rewarding, but you won't get that same feedback, that gut check, so to speak. It's a brain check, really, but we call it a gut check for making that kind of decision because it's totally new. It's in a new realm. The bad news is things are virtually certainly going to get worse before they get better. And we need to be prepared for that. We need to be psychologically prepared for that. And we need to persist even when our brains that are designed for looking at short-term consequences to our actions are going to be disappointed. We're not going to see those short-term consequences easily. But what will we see that can substitute for those obvious consequences of our decisions? That social reward that is very powerful where we do it together, we know about it intellectually, it doesn't have the same gut punch that other kinds of acquisition and decisions have in the past, in our historical past, and often in our personal past. And we have to do it anyway. You know, you spend some of your days operating on very sick little kids, on their brains. I mean, it's got to be, I don't know, an incredibly emotionally hard job. So for you personally, How does taking care of really sick kids relate to taking care of a sick planet? I don't think you can do one without the other. So at least for me, I'm sure there are many people who can compartmentalize. And the book describes how we do compartmentalize things, that this is my shift and that's your shift. I grew increasingly concerned about the world that I was making the kids I cared for better to go live in. And I really felt like there was a disconnect between the effort that I would spend on an individual child and the effort I personally was spending on this global problem that affects all children. So I have now really, just in the past year or so, made a a pretty hard transition uh, away from doing surgery on one child at a time and spending a lot more of my time on the whole climate realm. And part of that is the stage of my career. Part of that is the opportunities I've been given. But I see more and more physicians, particularly those who care for children, get invested in this work in some way. They are pressuring their supply chains to decarbonize. They are pressuring their institutions to take this seriously. They are working as advocates in their communities and in global health. So I think that, again, when we talk about changing changing your mind, yes, it happens one person at a time. But if the person down the hall from you or across the OR table or in the conference room with you, you find out they have a similar set of concerns, it is synergistic and people start building on each other. So that's what I was talking about, about social rewards being extremely powerful for people. If you're the only one, you feel like a weirdo. But as more and more people start to say, hey, I take care of kids. I do some high tech surgery or resource intensive surgery or whatever it is that I do. Um, I need to spend some of my effort on this other thing because we need to give them a world they can live in. And Christine Duhame is a pediatric neurosurgeon and author of Minding the Climate, How Neuroscience Can Help Solve Our Environmental Crisis. Thank you so much for joining us on Climate One. Thank you. Let's face it. Discussions about climate can often feel difficult and even depressing, even for us. And this is our job. Doom and gloom framing can drive people away from even thinking about the climate crisis. 
Dr. Jiaying Zhao is an associate professor of psychology and sustainability at the University of British Columbia. She believes that happiness, yes, happiness, needs to be a part of climate action, and has been running workshops to help people understand how they can pair them together. The point of this workshop is to ask people to come up with actions that not only reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but also increase their happiness at the same time. And the idea of bringing happiness into the picture is because the current narrative on climate action is very negative. On one hand, it's about doom and gloom narrative about the climate catastrophe and we're all doomed. On the other hand, it's about asking people to make sacrifices like drive less, you know, shop less, eat less meat. Those narratives make people feel shameful and guilty. And these negative emotions are not conducive to long-term behavior change. So as a behavior scientist, um, I teamed up with my colleague, Elizabeth Dunn, who's a happiness scientist, to, to come up with this happy climate approach. And if I was in one of these workshops right now, what would you do with me? What would your first question be to approach, to bridge happiness and climate? Yeah, I will ask you, Greg, what makes you happy? Uh, being outdoors, bicycling, exercise makes me feel good. Uh, seeing my family thrive uh, makes me happy and makes me feel good. That's perfect. So let me go over those actions. Being outside is great for happiness. Um, that's great. And you also mentioned bicycle, biking, right? Biking is excellent. That's exactly the, the actions we're trying to promote. Uh, in the sweet spot of carbon reduction and happiness promotion. Because biking uh, reduces the em emissions associated with driving alone, right? driving a you know, gasoline-powered vehicle. But at the same, same time, it, it, it provides moderate exercise that activates our endocannabinoid system. So that's typically the phrase, biker's high, that you experience that kind of euphoric feeling after you bike. And that contributes to happiness and greater mental well-being. So biking is perfect. And you also mentioned something about you're hanging out with friends and family. That's also great. Now, one of the biggest predictor of happiness is social connection. So spending time with family and friends turns out to be very good for our happiness. Now, what does it mean? What does it have to do with climate? That means we should turn a lot of our solo individual activities into social activities. So here's an example, carpooling. Now, I know carpooling is difficult to manage and because we all have different schedules. Uh, but if, you know, instead of driving alone in our car, I think we need to think about how to drive more people. So this is the changing narrative part. So instead of saying drive less, we should say drive more people. Now, it doesn't mean you didn't need to drive a bus. That's probably too much. <laughs> like, you know, whenever I go home or go to work, I think about who is going to be on my way and I'm going to reach out to them, say, you know, hey, I'm heading home in 10 minutes. Do you want to, do you want to join me? Oh, I can drive you. Do you want a car ride? And a lot of my colleagues actually turn out to say yes. I'm like, oh, sure. Yeah, let's meet. And then let's meet up in the garage and I'll drive you home. So I think those activities are not only good for the climate, but also good for our happiness and individual well-being. Mm, that's interesting. I just to share one example. Last night, I walked into a, a restaurant to get a veggie burger, and I recognized a woman who I know a little bit from cycling, doing the climate ride. And I wasn't sure if she recognized me or I recognized her. I turned to my table. I could have sat down and looked at my phone and eat my my veggie burger alone. But I decided to, for, for me as an introvert, take a social risk, went up and said, hey, you know, Lynn, how are you? And she ended up sitting down and started, gave me some fake bacon that this uh, restaurant has. It's made out of seaweed. And we had this con wonderful conversation about cycling and climate and, you know, and uh, alternative uh, plant-based proteins, that sort of thing. So that's the sort of thing you're saying we do more is like not just kind of be on our phone, go into our internal world, but connect with people, have conversations. And that's both happiness and climate action. That's absolutely right. I think the reason we don't do it as often is we have a bias there. We often underestimate 
the social benefits of connections and hanging out with people or reaching out. We often think, oh, no, I shouldn't do it. I shouldn't text this friend because I don't think they will respond or it must most probably to a lot of hassle for them. Or We kind of underestimate the, the, the well-being benefits of social connection. But I think we should do it more. And did you have a personal aha moment when you realized you could work on climate and be happy at the same time? <laughs> well, yeah, that aha moment came to me at the end of a, a long faculty meeting. This is a couple of years ago, where my colleague, Elizabeth Dunn, she's fantastic. Uh, she approached me and asked, you know, can we make climate action feel happy instead of miserable? And I'm like, that's it. That's right. Yes, we should. It, it should. We should do that. But nobody has ever you know, done that. So that was my aha moment. You've said that negative emotions are not conducive to behavioral change, uh, you know, the shame, et cetera. You know, it sounds like action, especially if it's healthy action, can increase happiness. But if someone's in a rut, feeling down, it's not easy to suddenly say, I'm going to take some action and feel better. It's often when we, you know, we feel least able to do those things is when we need them most. So how do they get out of that rut? I think uh, they need to do, they need to take this happy climate approach. They need to engage in activities that will make them feel better and happier at the end. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, you know, oh, well, some people act out of shame and guilt because they, they, they think if I do this, I will feel less guilty. Mm -hmm. That works for some mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. But for people who are already paralyzed and depressed and distressed over climate change, I think we need to maybe advocate more about those actions and say, you know what, go out for a bike ride, you know, get out into nature, maybe bring your friends along. Maybe as friends, now we are aware of this approach. And for people who, let's say, if I know someone who's depressed over climate change, I'm now going to actively reach out and say, hey, you want to go for a bike ride? You want to go for a veggie meal, an excellent vegan gourmet meal with me and a couple other friends? So we can actually bring those people out of that negative cycle uh, or rumination. Um, and I think it's that that's, that's one of the promising approaches to get combat those kind of negative mood. Mm -hmm. I saw Catherine Heo, the climate scientist at the climate conference in Egypt, and she said th she's starting to think that uh, you know, self-care is a form of climate action. Doing something healthy for oneself is actually enabling people to continue to work on these things. You know, but yet a lot of what this sounds like is reframing. Rather than saying eat less meat, you're saying eat more plants. Instead of drive less, you're saying bike more. What does your research tell us about the efficacy of that kind of reframing? We're just starting to collect data uh, to, to show the efficacy of this approach. Um, but this kind of reframing has been shown in other domains. And you can, so a parallel to this reframing is, you know, changing, let's say, the loss frames to gain frames or vice versa. So let me mm -hmm. give you an example. You can say, um, if you bring your own bag, you know, grocery bag, um, you can save 10 cents or, you know, 550 cents or whatever, like depending on how many bags you use. Um, now, saving money, that's like a game frame. Whereas, yeah, it's almost like, you know, you can get this these additional incentives. But if you say, if you don't bring these bags with you, you're going to have to pay 50 mm -hmm. cents or 10 mm -hmm. cents, right? So that's a mm -hmm. loss frame. Mm -hmm. So you can, and then those two frames, essentially they convey the same information, but they turn out to have different impacts on behavior. People, In some people... cases... People Sorry, worry a yeah. lot. More, people worry a lot more about. We're, we're more worried about losing ten cents than gaining ten cents. Is that? Well, I mean, yeah, we don't like losses. So this is mm -hmm. the loss aversion, uh, okay. which is kind of one of our biased cognitive biases. We hate losses more than the pleasure we get get from gains. So, mm -hmm. so the example is losing a hundred bucks is painful, um, and getting a hundred bucks is pleasurable, right? But the loss aversion phenomenon re refers to the fact that the pain from losing a hundred bucks is greater in magnitude than the pleasure we get from getting a hundred bucks. 
So this whole climate narrative about loss and losing and, and we're losing nature, focusing on the things we're losing, is that motivating or is that the right frame? Well, it is motivating, but it's also off-putting, right? So it doesn't make people more likely to engage. Um, it only makes some people, that's a, like, actually a minor, minority in the population. So the loss frame, I'm not saying that a loss frame doesn't work for everybody. But I'm just saying that for most people, on average, um, I think this positive game frame, you know, actually can be more effective than just using the loss frame. You're listening to a conversation about bringing happiness to climate action. This is Climate One. Coming up, how does happiness reinforce behavior? Your happiness benefit is instantaneous. When you bike, you feel better. When you hang out with your friends, you feel better. We need that instant gratification, instant reward to reinforce that behavior. That's up next. To stabilize the climate that supports our economy and lifestyle, we need to reform all of our systems, food, transportation, energy, water. As UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres remarked about the latest IPCC report, we need to change everything, everywhere, all at once. It's the biggest and most daunting challenge humanity has ever faced. Because of that, many people feel their individual choices are meaningless, trivial. I asked Dr. Jiaying Zhao, Associate Professor of Psychology and Sustainability at the University of British Columbia, how big an obstacle that can be. That is a, a huge barrier for action. So, um, so this is pseudo-inefficacy, I think. Right, so, so the, the bias you just mentioned is the false belief that almost everybody has, which is my own action doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm only a drop in the bucket. Mm -hmm. You know, if I do this, it's not going to make any difference to the climate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that perception, I mean, on the surface, it's true. Yeah, your own action on itself is going to make a tiny bit of difference. But if everybody believes that, then nothing will ever change. Nothing will ever be get done. So it's almost like we need people to believe that the you know your action matters and the collective action matters. We need most people. We mean we need everyone to do these things, and that will make a huge change. But I think the part of it also is that underneath that is that I will feel I incur the cost or the change or the pain. But I don't feel the benefits, you know, like the nature or the, the world receives the benefits, but I receive the cost today. And maybe the benefit is in the future far away from me. So that's why personal sacrifices can't work, because mm -hmm. I'm incurring this personal cost and I don't reap the benefits until much later. And mm -hmm. it, the benefits are not necessarily to me. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's why the current narrative and the thinking is not going to instigate transformative change. And this is why we need to bring happiness into this picture, because your happiness benefit is instantaneous. When you bike, you feel better. When you hang out with your friends, you feel better. Right. So that, that, that we need that instant gratification, instant reward to reinforce that behavior, to keep that behavior lasting longer. Right. I mean, I, I go to the gym because I feel better, not because I might they might uh, reduce the chance of a heart attack in 30 years. It's like I, right. feel, I feel good today. And driving an electric car, frankly, is a lot more fun than driving a gasoline car today. That's immediate. The thrill that the immediate exact uh, the the torque of a EV acceleration is immediate gratification. Yeah, absolutely. And so how does individual behavioral change lead to systemic change? Mm. You know, I guess you're saying that like if we hear that if ever, you know, if if everybody was vegan, you know, we would save the world if everybody if everybody did action X. But that's that's not how it works. Really. OK, so all social change starts with a small group of people. I'm mm -hmm. not the first one to say that. Mm -hmm. So here's here are the reasons why individual actions matter. Our action embody our values. Other people can look at what we do and our actions demonstrate to other people that we care, that we were, you know, let's say take EVs or biking or eating a plant-based meal. Those actions can be observed 
as seen by other people. And that's number one. It's a, it's a signaling. Now I, you know, my action embodies my values. It signals what I believe so other people can see. That's number okay. one. Okay. Number two is from this signal, we can actually start a ripple effect. And this is called social diffusion. So as soon as a small number of people start to engage in this action, then the number will grow. More, more people will see. This is how like things go viral on social media, right? I think there's a the most this recent social science research showing that there's a tipping point, uh, which is around 25% of the people in any community. As soon as you reach 25%, then things start start to go exponential. The more and more people will adopt mm -hmm. quickly after that. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if the 25% will apply to climate action, but I think we need to, you know, social diffusion occurs across different behaviors, across time. This is also called diffusion of innovation. If you look at the diffusion curve of any technology in the past, like TV, cell phones, microwaves, there's always this, there's always this diffusion curve that kind of outlines the speed of adoption of a new technology or a new behavior. So yes, it starts, any new action starts with a small group of people, but they diffuse. And ultimately that will, you know, eventually will get everybody on board. So that's the kind of the ripple effect part of individual action. Sure. And we've seen that with electric cars or solar in neighborhoods, even putting a mask on a bus or a plane. One person does it and other people go, ooh, I'll, I'll put on my mask. So it tends to normalize. In an article you wrote on a framework for addressing cognitive biases of climate change, you list a number of different kinds of biases. Which do you think are the biggest factors for accounting how conservatives and liberals form different opinions? Wow. So now you're bringing the political orientation into the picture which I think is a bit, one of the biggest barriers for climate action. For conservative liberals, I think one of the biggest biases is motivated cognition. By that, I mean, we look at information, we look at things, events in the world based on what we believe. It's almost like we're seeing things through a colored lens. So we actually did a study to show this phenomenon. So we showed people global temperature change, that global temperature change from 1880 to all the way to 2020, 2021. That curve, as you see, you know, it was mostly flat and it started to increase um, after the Industrial Revolution. It turns out that not everybody look, looks at the graph in the same way. I track them as they're looking at the graph. And we, we recruited, you know, liberals, conservatives, uh, people who are moderate, you know, centrist in the study. And what we found was liberal individuals tend to look more at the rising face of the curve. That's in basically the last 50 years or so. The hockey stick part of the, the hockey curve. stick. That's right. Mm -hmm. Whereas conservatives look at the flatter face of the curve. They look at information that's consistent with their beliefs and motivations. So we all we all have a story in our head about the way the world is. I learned this from the linguist at UC Berkeley uh, years ago, George Lakoff, that when we receive information, we either conform it to our worldview, our narrative, or we, we reject it uh, because it's easier to reject the information than to um, to change our worldview. So how do we overcome such deep seated biases if these are wired into our brains? That's a great question. This is actually called the confirmation bias. Um, mm -hmm. We see things according to, to confirm our prior beliefs, basically. Now, how do you change that? <laughs> um, there are a number of ways to do this. Um, one is using the right frame. So we, we previously we talked about loss and gain frames, but using the right frames that target their motivations and ideologies can work. So let me give you an example. Um, for conservative individuals, I think, you know, the frames that talk about national security. So let's say renewable energy will generate a warmer, more supportive society where everybody helps each other. It will um, help the economy, will help technological development. It will protect our nation from disasters that will cost us billions of dollars every year. So if you speak about renewable energy or climate solutions in those terms, that tends to get more support and attention from conservatives. Mm -hmm. 
rather than than polar bears and kumbaya rather than and, and environmental devastations and right. you know yeah planets yeah sure so there's a different frames that so you speak to their to their values well along those lines progressives ground many of their arguments in the virtues and sanctity of science is leading with science an effective way to talk to regular people about climate dis disruption and motivate action not really, because most people don't understand what science even means. Uh, <laughs> that term can be polarizing on its own. Uh, so in my communication with, you know, the public, I almost never say science. Um, wow. I, I mean, there, there, we had a whole march <laughs> for science at one point in, this, in, in the United States. Um, that's going to be, I think that's going to jolt some people hearing that. I, I think, you know, we need to use scientific evidence. That's absolutely true. We need to make policies and build programs based on scientific evidence. But using science in our communication sometimes can backfire. Uh, okay, so so use science, just don't talk about it when you're trying to persuade someone at a cocktail party that, yes, it's happening, it's real, it's urgent. Like, you, right, you can't convince a conservative individual that climate science says this because they don't believe in climate science to start with. So that's right. the point, right? But right. obviously, for liberal individuals or even people who are uh, centrists, I think science works. Like, they love the science narrative, right? They love the fact that 99% of climate scientists believe in the anthropogenic causes of climate change. Like, that's what they would listen to but not for conservatives and people who are skeptical about climate science to start with. So explain the importance. It sounds like you're talking about in-groups and out-groups. And for some people, scientists are an in-group. And for other people, uh, scientists are an out-group. So explain in-groups and out-groups and how that shapes how people evaluate relevance and risks of burning fossil fuels. Yeah. So that's the messenger effect. Who's conveying that information to you matters a lot. So people in general tend to listen more to, to in-group members. So let's say if I'm a liberal, I will listen more to the, the liberal party or you know progressive party leaders. And likewise, when we convey information about, let's say climate change, we need to engage conservative leaders or religious leaders who are considered their in-group members or in-group authority members. So, that's the the other kind of the, that that's the other finding from behavior science is that it's not just the information you're conveying, but it's the messenger who conveys that information uh, that can determine the re receptivity of that information. Right. So if a conservative talk show host says this is an apple, some people will believe it, and other people will say, "Oh no, he said it. It's not an apple." And, and if <laughs> if a progressive talk show host says this is an apple, some people say, "Yeah, that's an apple," and other people are like, "No, that's not an apple," just based on who's saying it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Um, so how do we talk across differences on climate and other polarized mm -hmm. issues? Is it possible to reach someone who's not in our in-group? Well, I, I, I'm hopeful. <laughs> I have family members who are very conservative, so I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm working on them. Um, as I said, you know, I think using the right frames is important. Uh, that actually speaks to their motivations and ideologies. Using the right messenger really matters. Um, I, I think right now we're at a time of extreme polarization. Um, and I think we have to be so careful when we communicate climate change or other socially sensitive topics with information to people. We can't just assume that because this hasn't worked with, let's say, liberals or other people, it's going to generalize to everybody. We can't make that assumption. Does lived experience matter? Some people will say that the wildfires in the in the West, uh, extreme flooding events that we're seeing in in the West this year, for some people that's like, yeah, this is climate change. But for others, are they making the connection? Um, I'm afraid that most people are not making the connection between extreme weather events to climate change. Now, I don't blame them. This is because the, the media uh, is not drawing that conclusion explicitly. And I think that's a huge missed opportunity. Um, I think for people who are aware, so for people who are like me, for instance, every time we experience extreme weather in Vancouver, I get really sad because this is just another you know, demonstration of climate change and we're suffering through it. 
But for most people, they're not drawing that connection. I mean, they just see it as, oh, this, this is just nature. This is just what happens. So I think, you know, communicators need to do a better job at, you know, maybe take the attribution science um, approach and, and deliberately draw that connection and say, that snowstorm was, you know, let's say once once in a, I mean, right, right now, Peru was going through a, a once in a lifetime uh, flood, right? I think this is where we, you know, journalists, the media can say, this is most likely, I mean, the Attribution Science Center will give you the exact statistic. Like, this is 80% due to climate change, or this is mostly due to climate change. I think we need to draw that connection more explicitly. Local weather uh, people are actually one of the few people that conservatives and liberals both watch, right? They, but we all watch the weather. That they're one of the few people that both sides will yeah. will listen to. They have a lot of power, and they're not connecting the dots on this storm as climate change. So as we wrap this up, you know, what's the takeaway about how to talk to people, how to how to activate change on to connect climate and happiness? I would encourage people to try the workshop. At least adopt the, the the mindset, this new narrative of we need to take actions that make ourselves feel happy and reduce emissions at the same time. We shouldn't just pursue that kind of, you know, sacrificial mindset or, you know, doom, uh, uh, kind of the, the, the doom and gloom mindset either. Um, I just, I want to encourage people, this is, you know, journalists, communicators, ed- educators, policymakers, to think about, can we improve individual well-being at the same time as planetary well-being? Dr. Jialing Jial, thanks for coming on Climate One today and sharing the possibility that we can be happy and act on climate and be more effective at the same time. Thank you, Greg, for having me. On this Climate One, we've been talking about how to understand and change our behavior to prompt more meaningful climate action. Climate One's empowering conversations connect all aspects of the climate emergency. Talking about climate can be often hard and difficult and depressing, and as we heard today, can also bring joy and happiness. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review. You can do it right now on your device. You can also help by sending a link to this episode to a friend. By sharing, you can help people have their own deeper climate conversations. Brad Marshland is our senior producer. Our managing director is Jenny Park. Our producers and audio editors are Ariana Brocious and Austin Cologne. Megan Basilia is our production manager. Wensi Shade is our development manager. Our theme music was composed by George Young. Gloria Duffy is CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton.